welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. I'm Laura. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. Today we're sitting down to discuss Fleischman is in Trouble by Taffy Brodesser Ackner, the latest book read by my book club. This was the book of summer 2019. Everyone seemed to have a copy and tells the story of Toby, a successful NYC doctor whose almost ex-wife Rachel has vanished, leaving him alone with their two children. But is she the selfish, self-absorbed, neglectful mother he portrays? It's been described as a Trojan horse of a novel, a sharp, dry portrait of the blind spots that come with male privilege and entitlement. But what did Laura's Book Club make of it? Keep listening to find out here on the Book Club Review. We have a special guest in the show this episode. We do have a special guest, a fitting special guest for Fleischman is in Trouble. And we have my daughter, who is seven weeks old and in my arms right now. And uh, we're going to give it a shot with her making funny cooing noises. Yes, yeah, so having hope that she might sleep, you know, we're then in that kind of position where she might sleep, she might not. She was sleeping, she's not sleeping. Yeah, so we're just going to go for it and she can join in if she wants to. Fleischman is in Trouble which I always want to call Fleshman is in trouble, which I realised was probably intentional on her part when oh, she picked that name, because that's not... That makes sense. It, it, there's, a, there's a kind of connection there's a lot of there. flesh. There's a lot of flesh in this book. <laughs> he is a doctor in New York City. Toby Fleischman is a doctor. Seems like a nice guy. He does, doesn't he, to begin with? You're yeah. kind of on his side. He's told from his point of view, or is it? Yes, his wife has gone missing, and he's been left with his two children. She's dropped them off. Early, early hours. He wakes up. They're in his apartment. I say his wife, his almost ex-wife. They are on the cusp of getting divorced. The paperwork's just being sorted. And she's disappeared. He doesn't know where she's gone. He can't get a hold of her. She owns quite a successful talent agency. And her PA isn't saying anything. So he's stuck with these two kids trying to figure out childcare and what to do with them and what to tell them, given that their mother has vanished and left no word. And they're getting increasingly upset. Yeah, so the children are, I think, 11 and 7. There's an older girl, Hannah, and then... Um, God, are they only, is she only 11? A boy. I think she's 11. Gosh. But the point being that they're young enough still to be needy. Anthony looking after, but at the same time, they're old enough that they can be sent away to sleep away camp or that they, he can take them into his office and leave them in the conference room for a day, which is important just in the terms of the things that have to happen in this novel so that people have time to move around and do other things. It's OK because the children are, are here or there. And that marriage. So the marriage between Toby and Rachel, it's become quite toxic, hence the divorce, although Rachel yeah. fought it every quite, step of the way. Quite toxic. I mean, it's it's just almost quite distressing to read, I suppose. The anger, the bitterness. The rage. My book club kept talking about Toby's rage. Toby's rage, yeah. I guess I feel like this has to be said, really, at the risk of spoiling it, but you don't always see it from Toby's point of view. And in fact, in the latter part of the novel, you see it from Rachel's point of view and you also see it from the point of view of this third person who Mm. turns out to have been the narrator all along who is another woman a friend of Toby's from his college days and then they spent a year in Israel together a potential one-time girlfriend but it didn't really work out and now she's married she lives in the suburbs with her husband Adam they've got two children of their own and she also writes. Mm, she's a sort of stand-in for Taffy Brodesser Ackner herself. They have more than one similarity in that she lives in New Jersey, children of the same age, similar age herself. And she was a writer for a men's magazine, which Taffy Brodesser Ackner also was. She wrote for GQ. I think that's why this novel has had so much attention. What well, one, because Taffy Brodesser Ackner has a major profile herself. She writes, have you read any of them? She writes these <laughs> profiles have... of celebrities. Yeah, so that's how I knew her from her journalism. She writes really, really interesting pieces for the New York Times. I haven't read any of her men's magazine stuff, but, you know, they sort of pop up online. And they're the sort of articles where you start reading them and immediately your attention is caught and they're full of ideas. I read a couple of her celebrity profiles and I was just thinking, you know, they're never about the thing that you think she's writing about. You know, I read one on Tom Hanks that ostensibly was a celebrity profile of Tom Hanks. But actually, it was about so much more than just being a profile of Tom Hanks. It was about decency and civility and niceness and what that might mean and burrowing beneath this persona of him as a nice guy and why journalists are always trying to get at this dark side if it exists and why the media wants that so much and coming down to her own personal feelings about the life that she's trying to lead and her children growing up witnessing that life and then perhaps discovering that she's not the good person that she purports to be when she tries to (laughs) imbue them with values and ways to live a decent life in society and the impression you get is they're just very rich her pieces 
And I love that about them. I just think she's a brilliant writer, brilliant journalist. Mm. Interesting then to read her in novel form and see her take on that. And I was just reading this morning that actually she pitched an article about divorce or maybe a series of articles about divorce to her editor. And her editor said, oh, no, no one wants to read about that. And she went away and wrote the first 10 pages of this novel, or at least 10 pages of the novel. And that's where this book came from. So it comes from an impulse to explore divorce and how marriages break down and how what started out with real love, because Rachel and Toby really did love each other, how that falls apart with a very acute look at the woman's role. And for me, that's, I mean, you've already given that teaser away haven't you yes that we turn to Rachel's perspective I think this is the sort of novel where really in order to discuss it in any meaningful way you do have to look at the structure of it and the different points of view in it and I think actually that shifting of viewpoint from Toby's to Rachel's and then this narrator's viewpoint yeah. as well all of that is crucial so it has to be out there I'm afraid <laughs> right and and for me that's why it's such a strong novel I'm not gonna say great novel but she really does do something I think quite exceptional in this twist not the twist to Rachel's perspective but the twist to the narrator's point of view and how actually this is about her midlife crisis and her marriage too and her assessment of what it means to be a woman trying to have her own identity Mm -hmm. while she feels like she's being sucked into middle class mediocrity in New Jersey she's only a mother now she's not writing herself And the novel gets super meta, of course, because we discover towards the very end that's not only that she's narrating it, she has written the book herself. I mean, obviously she hasn't because she's a fictional character, but that is the perspective. Have you picked out a section that you wanted to read? On the subject of this narrator's voice coming in at the end, you know, and how it almost turns into one of her think pieces, one of her essays. Very much. It's when I sort of liked it at its very most, towards the end, where you start to understand where it's all been going all this time. Yeah, it's been a profile of a marriage and two very flawed individuals, hasn't it? Yes, but also motherhood, I thought. For me, that came across very strongly and and how motherhood undoes a woman in many ways and the repercussions of that and what society expects of mothers and the women themselves. And, and we've had hints of it all the way through, seen indirectly through Toby's perspective you then see it directly when you learn more about Rachel and then this narrator comes in at the end to almost give you the final analysis and it becomes I how could I find my way back to a moment when my life wasn't a flood of obligations but an endless series of choices each one designed to teach me something about existence and the world as opposed to marring me for life at some point I didn't remember when I had taken all my freedom and independence and pushed them across the poker table at Adam and said here take my jackpot take it all I don't need it any more. I won't miss it ever I mean that's more kind of marriage but then the motherhood thing what were you going to do were you not going to get married when your husband was the person who understood you and loved you and rooted for you forever no matter what were you not going to have your children whom you loved and who made all the collateral damage your time your body your lightness your darkness worth it You know, everything goes when you then come back to examine yourself, what you're left with. I think it can be hard to come back to who you are. And Rachel becomes unraveled. And that's how she's left at the end of this novel, which for me was a big frustration. She just left her there. Yeah, my problem with it, and we haven't quite got into it, is that they live in such a rarefied world. You know, they live in the Upper East Side and Rachel is earning millions every year. And it's sort of this ongoing joke that Toby, as a successful doctor earning $300,000 a year, is poor. And so I found it quite difficult to have a lot of sympathy for them. And actually, although the summing up in those bits that you just read is really profound, I didn't feel like Rachel was a very good... I don't know, just a very good example of this. And even the narrator herself, who has given up her career to live in the suburbs, in my mind, I was like, right, but if you are Taffy Brodus or Ackner, if you're supposed to be kind of one and the same, the reality is that Taffy is an incredible, Taffy, what a name. Mm -hmm. Taffy is an incredibly successful journalist and she's just written a very successful book and she's killing it. But that's not shown in this book. And when I mentioned that to my book club, some of the women were like, well, why don't we get that story? You sent me the article in Real Simple that Brodus or Ackner had written about how she managed to do all these things. Well, yeah, and more interestingly than that, it was about how she wanted to be able to do all these things. And that was a, it was a, a rebuttal against a culture that keeps telling women to calm down, to have mindfulness mm. in their lives, to take the essence of the moments, to let your thoughts fly away, to leave your thoughts at the door while you do <laughs> yoga for an hour. 
and that this in itself becomes a kind of regimen. You know, there's a pressure to conform to this ideal about having this perfect mindful life where everything is calm and in order and she's just like I'm not that kind of person <laughs> and then she lays out all the reasons why she's not that kind of person which is extremely convincing and then she explains why she loves being busy and chaotic and being able to chase her ideas the second they come into their head and that all of that is really important to her creative process but always with that you know more interesting than that twist about well why why does society expect this of women and what are we to make of it that it does yeah, it's interesting because obviously I read this book before I was a mother and then I became a mother and I'm only seven weeks in, but I have some sense of the ties that bind you to this little person in a way that I didn't before. But I still struggle with the fact that Rachel so obsessed with social climbing, or at least that's how Toby sees it as social climbing. And when you switch to Rachel's perspective, it's actually more about making sure her children fit in, but it feels so shallow that I don't have much sympathy with it. Yeah, but at the same time, so I, not confession exactly, it's almost like a good thing, I suppose, but I'll tell you my reason for having a problem with it in a minute. But I read this book twice. I read this book, first of all, when we did it for book club and I was sort of reading along with you. And that time I read it for plot, you know, the way I tend to read mm. anything. Yeah. And so I enjoyed it very much. I loved all the details. I thought it was full of ideas, but I found the plot ultimately kind of frustrating and, and a bit underwritten and it felt hasty to me. And I had that real simple article in mind. And I just remembered her <laughs> saying of the million and one things that she had accomplished this year that she'd also managed to write this book. And I just thought, yeah, but if you'd taken a bit more time on it, I think it would have been better. Mm. But then I read it again. And the thing is, when I read it again on a second reading, and I wasn't reading it for plot, and I kind of knew where it was going, and I was really able to focus on the actual sentences, I just kept sitting back and thinking how remarkable it was. It's so full of ideas and really interesting ideas. And, and we talked about Silence of the Girls, the Pat Barker novel, which is retelling the Iliad from the point of view of Briseis, a captured Trojan princess. And my friend Katie, who did that show with me, just said, it's such an angry book. It's such an angry book. I love it. It's such an angry book. Mm. And I felt the same about this. I thought, my God, this is an angry book. It's all in there. It's packed in there. You know, the story about Rachel giving birth, where she is in the position where she's left alone and, and for various chain of events due to the fact that she's being induced and the baby is not progressing and then the consultant wants to give her a cesarean. She doesn't want to. She wants to have the baby naturally. And then what he ends up doing is forcibly breaking the membrane of her uterus so that her waters break. And then from then on, she has to have the cesarean. But so she is effectively violated. Mm. She's powerless. There's no one there. Toby isn't there to look after her. And that's a crucial point. He wasn't there. For good reason. I mean, he had only just stepped out. Was it a good reason, though? Was it? Um, <laughs> Not from her perspective. She then struggles. She can't even bring herself to hold this baby after the baby finally arrives. And she's just so wrecked and traumatized by this experience. I mean, she's so angry at this doctor and being in this position and being powerless in this position. And then she ends up going to a rape um, survival group. Exactly, yeah. because she feels she's been violated. She knows rationally in her head that she wasn't raped, but the violation was there of her body and her rights. And she just goes and cries, doesn't she? And she does, but, you know, that's just one element. I felt the kind of rage for that, for mm. her being in that position, because because this happens. I know people, not that this specific thing has mm. happened to, but I know people who've been in situations like that. I know of people who've just had an awful time after they've given birth. And it's just not there, the support and the understanding. It should be, but it isn't. And women are sort of judged then and every moment thereafter against these standards of motherhood. And, and, and then in this novel, that's very much bound up with being a wife and marriage and this partnership. And I love the fact that when you see it from Toby's point of view, I was so on his side. Yeah. And he seems very sympathetic. Yeah. And then there's just little touches where you're like, oh, man, that was a dick move. Why'd you do that? A little bit. And you think, oh, and also there's this sort of thing about he's just going a bit crazy because he's got all these dating apps. You know, now that he sort of feels <laughs> he's been released from this marriage, he's just going a bit nuts kind of exploring the world of sexual availability that's out there to him. You know, because there are all these women for whom an available, attractive New York doctor is, is prime cat. Yeah. And he's sort of fighting them off and, and reveling in that. And again, you sort of feel like, well, you know, he's had a really awful time. He deserves to have some fun. But as the novel goes on, you start to think, does he actually, is this, is he not perpetuating this system, this, this meaningless system that demeans these women and everybody really? And 
Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It means everyone because it's such a shallow interaction. And when it gets a little bit more real, he's suddenly repulsed by the woman who he's been infatuated all along. It's just suddenly she's incredibly unattractive to him. Yeah, and I do think it's very clever in that you get drip fed these moments. So when he fires their nanny of like thir- yep. 11, 13 years, whatever it is, because he comes home and finds that his son was trying to find out I think what like female body parts look like yeah. and stumbled into like hardcore porn so you kind of sympathize with Toby but at the same time Toby has insisted on this nanny coming in even though her son is in town from Puerto Rico and she's given him tons of advance notice and Toby's such a martyr isn't he he's always like oh yes I will always put the kids first and then the next opportunity he has he's off shagging the women on dating apps but he doesn't see that as inconsistent no he's convinced that Rachel is the one who's obsessed with money. But from Rachel's point of view, he's the one who's enjoying all the benefits of her money. Exactly. So there's this really interesting uh, role reversal because in their relationship, she actually is the man. Yes. She is the dominant earner. She is the one who goes out there and is providing all this money for them to live this lifestyle. So, so it's shown that she's the one who wants this fancy lifestyle. Again, second reading, I started to be much more aware of the reasons why she thought she wanted this lifestyle, why she felt she needed this lifestyle so much. And again, that's cultural, that's society. I found her quite unbelievable and shallow, and I would have liked more depth to why she was the way she was. But Alice in my book club, Alice H, was like, oh, no, I know this woman. She's like, I worked for this woman. She was aggressively aspirational in a way that was not going to bring her any joy in life and always going to leave her feeling inadequate. But these people exist. They're out there. Yeah, absolutely. And and I suppose the question is not so much that they're there, but why might they be like this? What is it about our affluent Western society in which we have everything we want. We have so much. Even people who don't have much, who live here in Western Europe or America, have a lot. And yet, what is it about us? We're so unhappy in all our happiness. I think that's a line from this, actually, which really stayed with me. I kept thinking about that. It kept coming back to me at different moments. And I just think it's all so interesting because I think, obviously, she's struggling with these things. And I love the way that that seems to come into everything she writes about. It seems very personal. She's almost that age, perhaps, where... Again, when your children, when they're very young, they just need you a lot and it's all encompassing. They then get to a point where they start to be independent of you, relatively speaking. And although you're still really important, it's a very different relationship. And then ultimately, of course, the reason you have children in the first place is because you want them to grow up and go off into the world. And so they'll leave you. And then what are you left with? If you've thrown yourself, hook, line and sinker, every part of you, every atom of your being into your life with these children what's left for you when they go if on the other hand you struggle Mm. to preserve your identity as an individual you know who you are pursuing your career making money making your dreams come true at the cost of then neglecting your time with them which you will never get back have you then lost something and I and I think she's saying I don't know but I love the way that she's exploring the question and I and I don't see many people I feel like I haven't really read this much Mm. and I like very much that she's out there doing it yeah I guess I just found it was such a rarefied example that it felt less compelling than if it was a slightly slightly more ordinary circumstances I suppose our narrator is supposed to be the more ordinary example really yeah we have those two mothers she's your standard suburban New Jersey mom doing the carpool yeah organizing the play dates yeah and she's struggling a lot you know she loves her husband he loves her but the reason she's so wrapped up in this story is because she's so unhappy at home and so she's going into town and spending time with Toby who I mean maybe we realize he's a bit of an asshole as the story goes along because our narrator is reminded that he's a bit of an asshole you know he's a very selfish person and she realizes that he has no time for her own midlife crisis it's just all about him 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 exactly I think but the problem with the second reading is that generally in life people don't read books twice that's not to say people don't reread of course there's a great pleasure in rereading Generally speaking, you don't, unless you're judging from the Booker Prize or something like that, you don't tend to read a book and then immediately go back and read it again slightly more carefully. And so it's true that on my first reading of this book, where I was interested in plot and character, I was much less satisfied with it as a novel. I felt like it was rushed. I didn't think the characters were really developed enough. For example, Rachel and the backstory, you know, she's given a grandmother who raised her and supposedly was really unhappy about having to do that. And, yeah, just... But there's no there's no story. She's not really interested in fleshing any of that out. 
the second time I read it, I thought, oh, because they're kind of ciphers. They're not really yes, supposed yeah, to be real. And yeah. so it doesn't really matter about any of that because they're just vehicles for all these ideas. And I respected it for that. But and a lot of reviews talk about the fact that this is a very funny novel. I'm not sure I found it funny, certainly not laugh out loud. But I think there is a sense that they are meant to be, as you say, ciphers. And it is a satire, really, of marital dysfunction and unhappiness in a certain level of Upper East Side society. I love this. I suppose you, 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 know, you, you pick out the things that chime with you. But um, if you needed to know the most disparate thing about Adam and me, it was that he loved weekends and I did not. I liked order and routine. Weekends were an abyss that was exactly long enough to stare back at me. And I thought, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same way about weekends. And bank holidays. Bank holidays are the worst. They don't have bank holidays in, in America, but Taffy, Britta, Sackner. If you had to... They have long weekends. If you had to get through a bank holiday, <laughs> they're the worst. They're even worse than weekends. Whole Foods. Yes. Now, with direction, he walked to the one on 87th Street, through the aisles, letting the artisanal brown packaging fuel some kind of hope for renewal in him. He walked through the moisturiser aisle. Maybe he needed to shake up his skincare routine. Maybe he needed wildflower aromatherapy. Maybe he needed hemp oil. Maybe he needed coconut water. No, but really, what if he started an aromatherapy routine? What if he got a diffuser that let the oils waft around him at night? He would wake up and be filled with renewed cells and hormone rushes, and then he would start meditating, and then his life would... And I just thought, it was so funny. Who doesn't feel like that in a health food store? You know, you wander around and you get a bit excited about, like, acai berries and the possibility of, you know... <laughs> wellness. <laughs> of wellness generally, and a renewed yeah. life, renewed energy. So I just think all the little observations that are in there. Well, did you spot the one about the book club? The narrator talks about attending her book club where they read all the novels by ethnic minorities. <laughs> it's just very, very cutting oh, and did. also recognisable. I did miss that. Well, so sort of summing up, what was a bit more of the book club discussion? What did your book club think? It was a really good book club discussion and ooh, full disclosure, I hadn't finished it by the time I went to book club. So actually, I was probably a much better listener than usual. I had opinions and that I wasn't enjoying it very much, but I was able to listen to everyone else's perspectives, probably with more attention than usual. So it was a good discussion. I sort of thought people hadn't really enjoyed it, similar to me, but actually Francis, Charlie and Phil were saying how much they enjoyed it and that they'd recommend it to anyone. Catherine and Joe were a bit harsher on it. They were just saying, if you'd chopped a third of it off, mm. it would have been a better book. Because there's so much Toby. She's supposed to be... I mean, I didn't know this, but Francis was saying, you know, she's riffing on these 1980s novels by Roth and Wolf that told the male perspective of this glittering, slightly uh, shallow existence. Well, and John Updike, there's this thing about the rabbit novels, which I've never read, but which are held up, aren't they? They're in the literary cultural canon. And that, as I understand it, is the portrait of a marriage from the male perspective. Mm. And then you hear the female perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think it's quite shocking, that change of viewpoint. And if this is somehow a response to that, and I think you had read that, I'm sure this would be even more interesting. There's that whole layer to it that's lost on me. but mm. Yeah, and that's exactly it. That's what Francis was saying, you know, that it's part of this tradition. And that's what makes the twist to Rachel's perspective. And also the kind of unraveling of Toby's personality as you go through it. So clever, but there's still a lot of Toby. Catherine was saying, no, but that's why the, so much Toby then? Isn't that the point? She's written out of most of this novel. And that, that says something. She's not there. Because women are marginalised and ignored. And, you know, there's this thing about visibility, you know, as a mother. We've talked about this on the podcast before. Mm -hmm. We did Lullaby by Leila Slamani. I right, talked about yes. how I was able to effectively shoplift a bottle of wine from Waitrose. Because <laughs> no one looks at you when you're a mother in a buggy. Now, this is... Just in case anyone from Waitrose Customer Services is listening, this is an accidental theft. <laughs> but, you know, it's this invisibility. And, and I just thought that was really interesting. I like the fact that actually she only comes in at the very end. And it's only when you start to question that and think, well, why is this so wildly out of proportion that you just sort of think, well, yeah, she should have been there and she wasn't there. No one really wants to hear her viewpoint or her perspective. Well, Except, of course, we do. We yeah, do. Yeah, we do. And because that's... we're women and we, we want to hear her point of view. But I think the larger point is 
generally people don't want to hear all that. But that's what I found a little bit annoying is that she has this incredible career. She's yes. incredibly high profile. Actually, you don't realise how high profile she is until it switches to her story because Toby is just obsessed with her income rather than her reputation. And I think at some point, just in passing, you realise that this talent agency she's founded has like a hundred people on it. Even her success, I've just read, again, this is all quite fresh in my mind, but I've just read She Said by Jodie Cantor and Megan Tui which is the book about the Harvey Weinstein story. And that tells the story of their investigation for the New York Times that ultimately led to the breaking of that story. And then the kind of repercussions with the whole Me Too movement going on to Christine Blasey Ford and the Brett Kavanaugh hearings and, and encompassing all of that. And I just thought it's interesting that... Taffy Britis Agner chose to give her this role in the sort of media industry and that then that role is compromised isn't it early on in her career she has a boss who makes a pass at her and then the repercussions for that are that later years later she's passed up for promotion that's the nudge that leads her to go and set up her own agency and she's pregnant at that point and he says oh well we didn't promote you not because you're pregnant but because you didn't tell us you're pregnant and she's just like <laughs> seriously yeah <laughs> And then later when she has her own thriving, flourishing, independent agency, there's the, this other successful businessman that she gets entangled with who, again, uses his power and masculinity against her. And I feel like that was the point that was even her success was shown to be at the behest of the various men that had power at crucial moments. Oh, For me, it was more just that her success was irrelevant almost to her and to Toby. Which is sad, but her success didn't compensate for her feelings of inadequacy as a mother and her kind of obsession with making sure that her children had all the right connections. Like the Rothbergs are an incredibly wealthy New York family, long established, and Rachel makes it her life goal to be friends with Miriam because she thinks it will be good for her children. She wants them to be part of the kind of social elite. She wants yeah. them to be part of the right cliques because she herself as a child was not and part of that world. And, and that's and just what I found so tiring because it just seemed to me if you're going to do an examination of motherhood and the insecurities of motherhood why make this obsession with being in the very very upper echelons of society the rod that breaks her i think she herself doesn't understand why she wants and craves those things and i think it's the idea that she feels like those are the things she needs to have to be successful and secure doesn't come from her it comes from the American society and culture that she lives in. It is interesting because I do think, well, hey, I'm sure that there is a parallel story to be told about upper class, upper middle class, London society, maybe in slightly different neighbourhoods. I feel like Northwest London, everyone, you, no matter how much money they have, they tend to try to pride themselves on being grounded. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure, maybe maybe over in like Notting Hill. <laughs> Sorry, Notting Hill. I mean, I haven't been to West I, London in a no, while. I went over to Holland Park the other day and oh my God, yeah. it's like another world there. <laughs> and I walked around and I was just slightly open mouthed. I was like, oh, it's so nice here. And I just thought, oh, and God, clean. We're, just, we're just scratching out an existence in North London, aren't we? Like a <laughs> grubby street. Yeah. So I, I do think there's an American slant to this which is that they just work really bloody hard yeah whenever i work with american clients their perspective on work and how much you would work it is just quite different so maybe i should give the book a bit more benefit of the doubt than perhaps i am i don't know is that coming through you just have to read it twice oh uh, well i kind of did and that i started it in print and sort of skimmed to the end, I had a book club. And then to make sure that I was more informed for this episode, I listened to it. So in a way, I sort of have. And that's why I can appreciate the structure of it. I think yeah. that's very clever and unusual. And she pulls it off. But it was quite a slog. I mean, even you said the first time around, you just didn't really love it. Yeah, I think so. I, Nothing I, much happens. I like the, It's funny. I like the details. And I just didn't sort of like the overall the first time. And mm. then when I read it the second time, I think I sort of started to understand the details. <laughs> mm. So I think the strongest sections occur when she is turning on her journalistic style and making those really clever assessments of society and culture. Whereas when it comes to plot and character, it's a bit more lightweight. I have a friend who is divorced and he read this book and he was telling me he sort of found it remarkable for the kind of insight of the perspective of the divorced man. and he read it as the cycle of emotions you go through you know was it denial anger grief 
Mm. And then a kind of acceptance, maybe. Mm. And he saw that in it. I think it definitely works on that level, actually. I can imagine people reading it and getting that from it. And that's not a bad thing. But for me, there's this sort of whole other layer underlying that, which is looking at marriage and relationships and the larger forces that mm. put so much pressure on individuals and and women and women and stack the odds against them working out i mean there's a reason why so many marriages end in divorce and it's interesting to examine that mm. or i thought this was an interesting take on examining that well i think for that reason it was a very good book club book i think it's like the best kind of book club books in that it's good but flawed yes and there's a lot to talk about it's about the structure the characters well toby is just this man having sex non-stop charlie memorably said i just don't believe he would get this much sex <laughs> Well, he's presented as quite good looking. His only flaw is that he's a tiny bit short. Yes. Which obviously you wouldn't necessarily know via a dating app. True. So I, I bought that. I wasn't so worried about that. Uh, I don't I know, which is also a bit of a joke though, isn't it? Because he's, he's a short, very angry man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. I don't know. I might read this a third time and declare it a masterpiece. Oh gosh. Well, it does feel like the kind of book you could study and write about because mm. there's so much in it down to those perfectly turned phrases. So a good book club book. And I think even if you don't read this book, seek out her writing online because she's just such an interesting writer and well worth checking out. Inspired by Fleischman is in Trouble, here are some more recommendations for your next book club pick. Oh, she's, so... she's been snoozing very happily for okay. almost the entire episode. We're just going to manage to get our recommendations done before she wakes up. Shall we tell her about Fates and Furies by Lauren Groff, which I did for my book club a long time ago. I remember it was a really good book club book. It's got a great twist, which makes it almost impossible to talk about it. It does. Um, but so you've got these two characters, Lotto and Matilda, and it's another one where first it's told from his point of view and then it's told from her point of view and it's about their marriage. They're kind of quite glamorous. Everything seems so great, seems so amazing, but is it really underneath? It's quite exaggerated. I loved that book. Me too. It's really just a great read. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's quite it's, gothic. It's, quite, it's yeah. almost Dickensian. Yeah, and, and quite dark sometimes. And talk about fury and rage. There's plenty of that in there, but in a way that's just completely delicious. I thought I absolutely loved it. And it was just a really good book club because it was perhaps a little bit less serious minded than perhaps what Taffy yeah. Brothers was trying to do with Fleshman but yeah definitely, definitely. even though even though Fleshman actually is a comedy in lots of ways I am going to recommend Alain de Botan's The Course of Love which you have read and I have read because it never made it onto the podcast but in the very very early days where we we're exploring what the podcast could be we talked about it Alain de Botin is a thinker and a writer, and most of his books are non-fiction. But The Course of Love was his exercise in writing a novel about marriage. I like Alain de Botin. I think Do he you? gets a lot of stick for basically trying to help everybody lead richer, slightly more thoughtful Middle class lives. He's very sort of earnest about it, and I think that's why he gets mocked so much. And if you ever see him live in person, he's so funny. Anyway, is he? okay, interesting because he's not a funny writer, is he? He's, he does come across as very earnest. Well, he can. No, I, I disagree. He can be. Well, maybe. I, I remember we disagreed about this book, which is why we were, we were probably already battling me. But Alain de Botin tells the story of Rabbi and Kirsten, who meet in Edinburgh, fall in love, get married, have children, go through the ups and downs of what a marriage well what a marriage can be and I really didn't like this book you liked it so we know it's good material for a proper debate one of the things that is most remarkable about it is that he has again in a very earnest vein dropped in italics throughout the story which sum up the state of love or marriage or relationships and they take you out of the story it's almost like you are reading one of his essays and they're quite, quite funny. Unintentionally, I would say, Kate. So, yes, The Course of Love, definitely not as interesting as Fleischman is in trouble. But for a British take on marriage, I think, I think it would be good. I think it's very wise. I think the thing I no. thought was that he's obviously been to quite a bit of marriage guidance counselling or, you know, therapy. <laughs> and very usefully, he packages up all the, all the kind of good oh, bits from that into this book. So the characters are terrible because... The thing is, they're not really supposed to be characters. They're just points of view. And then this Greek chorus, the italics come in and, and almost give you the kind of what's really happening underneath. But I thought it was really interesting. Mm, you, in the, in, speaking of the italics, you get phrases like this. 
Love reaches a pitch at those moments when our beloved turns out to understand more clearly than others have ever been able to, and perhaps even better than we do ourselves, the chaotic, embarrassing and shameful parts of us. That someone else gets who we are and both sympathizes with and forgives us for what they see underpins our whole capacity to trust and to give. Love is a dividend of gratitude for our lover's insight into our own confused and troubled psyche. That's that marriage counselling right there. So true. But yes, yeah, so as another take on marriage, quite a different one, non-fiction, more perhaps therapeutic than novelistic, even though it, it does purport to be a novel, but would be a really interesting book club read. We certainly had a very interesting time discussing it back in the day. That's all for this episode. On our next book club show, we'll be discussing Stories of Your Life and Others by Ted Chiang which was Laura's last book club pick, a collection of sci-fi short stories, one of which was made into the film Arrival, starring Amy Adams, Chiang has quietly gained a reputation as one of the most interesting sci-fi writers out there. But what did Laura's book club think? Listen in to find out. And if you missed it, do check out our special episode on a subject close to our hearts, how to start and run a flourishing book club. It's packed full of inspiration, so whether you're interested in discussing your books out in the fresh air, like The Walking Book Club of Hampstead Heath, tackling a literary masterpiece like the Proust Book Club of Paris or celebrating your love of a beloved author like the Chili Cooper Book Club, listen in to hear all about it. Plus, our latest bookshelf episode is also up in which we discuss the books we've been reading outside of our book club, the ones we get to pick and choose. Those shows are available to download now on our podcast feed. Finally, if you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or email thebookclubreview at gmail.com. And if you like what we do, please do take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. It helps other listeners find us and means you'll never miss an episode. But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading.